Welcome to LD Disrupt, the podcast dedicated to helping you overcome workplace challenges and prepare for the future of work today. I'm your host, Nelson Sidlingham, and I'll be speaking with the movers, shakers, and path breakers in LD who are reshaping their organizations right now. Join us each week as we delve into the highs and lows of work in the industry to get to the real nitty gritty stuff that you actually care about. Uh, so I'm super, super excited for today's um, show. This is the third um, installment of l and Disrupt Live, and I'm your host, Nelson Sivalingham. I'm, I'm one of the founders at How Now. And today's session is all about leading with impact, so how to match your actions uh, to your intentions. And I'm super excited because we've got Ali Jones with us. And Ali's an absolute pro when it comes to enabling uh, leadership teams with the kind of skills, tools, frameworks, and just the confidence to be able to build a high performance culture, which we all know uh, can be quite challenging. Um, I'm looking forward to learning a lot from Ali today um, and also learning a lot from those of you who are, who are in this virtual room. Um, do feel free to, you know, if there's anything you hear that we're discussing that you've experienced and you're familiar with those challenges, then do share your stories as well. Uh, stick it in the chat and also share your questions. Uh, we'll pick them up in the Q&A section at the end. Uh, we'd love to have you come on camera and ask those questions and put those questions to, to Ali and myself. Um, but hopefully by the end of this session, we walk away with um, actionable tactics to, to be better leaders. Um, and that's really what the focus of today's show is. So let's kick off, Ali. If we can start with you telling us your life story in about 90 seconds so we can all get to know you. My life story, where do I start? Uh, incredibly sleep deprived, probably the first place <laughs> to start. Um, I have two boys. So Oliver, he is almost five and Joey has just turned one. Um, we literally landed back from Lanzarote last night after booking some very cheap flights from Stansted. It's not worth the extra drive. Um, more importantly, if I think about my career, um, Born and bred in Brighton, have spent pretty much all of my career in learning and development, but more specifically uh, leadership development. So after I had um, my eldest, Oliver, um, I left my role as head of learning and development um, in financial services, and I set up as an independent coach and facilitator. So I've spent almost the last five years now um, working with early stage and, and hyper growth tech companies um, on all things leadership um, and basically being decent human beings and also alongside that being able to get the best from your team. Win-win, hopefully. Um, Ali, before we dive into the questions uh, about being an impactful leader, can you see the beach from where you're sitting? No, sadly not. Um Although I have got a view over the South Downs, so not the beach, but not totally unpleasant either. Lots of greenery. I'll take that over what I can see out the window any day. Um, Ali, I wanted to kick off with a concept that you talk about um, a fair bit, which is the the awareness gap, right? Um, So maybe let's start with what is the awareness gap? So for me, the the awareness gap is basically the difference between the intention that we have when we behave or act a certain way and actually how that behavior action actually lands. Um, I like to think that, you know, we are all decent human beings in life and at work. Um, I don't think any of us rock up with the intention to upset, frustrate, piss off, anything like that, anybody else. Yet, you know, we've all been there and we've all done it. So there's obviously something uh, kind of in between that, the positive intentions that we have when we rock up to actually how people might describe us in a certain situation. That, for me, the, the difference there is the awareness gap. Right. And, and you know, just you alluded it to there, but what are examples of, of how can I see a leader who's kind of being affected by the awareness gap? So you say a leader, I actually think it's something all of us fall foul to, if I'm being totally honest. Um, So some examples here, um, if I think about something topical like feedback, 
perhaps a manager that uses the the sandwich approach or the the shit sandwich for giving feedback. The the intention there is to not upset the other person. It's not to demotivate them. Um, The impact that that actually has is the person leaves that conversation not clear of actually, am I being told something that I'm great at or am I being told something I need to to focus on? Um, Or you might see it, for example, somebody in your team comes and says, hey, Ali, can you can you help me with this problem? Um, Either then offer a load of advice. My intention is to be super helpful. The impact that actually I potentially have had is that individual feels totally judged because the advice that I've given them is totally way off where they were thinking. Um, So this happens every single day. um, And it's not necessarily anything that we're doing wrong, but there is lots that we can do to try and reduce that gap. Right. And how do we become aware that we have an awareness gap in the first place? Uh, I think the first thing is to admit that you've got one because we all have one, um, that there's no escaping it. Um, there are lots of things that people can, can do. I think the, the biggest thing for me and thinking about tangible and quick wins that I can implement immediately is just finding the time to give yourself some headspace. Um, that doesn't have to be 20 minutes or an hour or half a day for a big piece of self-reflection, but just where can I interject two, five, 10 minutes of time to really reflect on on how my behavioral impacts have had or may have if I'm thinking about something I've got coming up. And Ali, how have you seen kind of the awareness gap affects your ability to build relationships within the organization? Huge, absolutely huge. So if I think about and I'll perhaps give an example here about senior leaders, because I think the more senior we become, actually the greater this awareness gap potentially right. can be. Um, so in terms of thinking about why, or perhaps answering my own question there about why when we become slightly more or more senior, does that gap increase? I guess it's thinking about psychological safety. And and as we become more senior, how safe is somebody likely to feel to give me the feedback that I potentially don't want to hear? Um, You know, I think, Nelson, as CEO, sorry to to pick on you here, but thinking about when you're in that role, um, actually the impact somebody might feel that they have if they were to give some feedback might yeah. look and feel quite different if they were to give that to their peer. Um, though I slightly digressed from your, your question. Could you just re- repeat it? I've gone off into a complete tangent. You know what, Ali? Forget that. We'll come back to that question. Let's go right. build on. I, I like what you just said there in terms of, you know, the more you go as, I guess, in the uh, hierarchy of the organisation, um, the creating that psychological safety to receive that feedback in the first place. And, and I'm sure there are many people of a senior um, leadership role who would still like to get that feedback, but maybe they're unaware that they haven't created the environment for people to feel comfortable to give that feedback in the first place. So what can they do to, I'm sure they want feedback, but they're not getting feedback. So what can they do to create an environment where people feel comfortable enough to, to share the feedback? So going back to that point then around psychological safety is thinking about as a leader and as a senior leader, what are some of the things that I can do to help encourage that? So um, Leaders Eat Last, it's a, I think it's a book, but you know, Leaders Speak Last being something we talk about quite a lot, giving everybody else in the room space to, to actually articulate their thoughts and feelings around something before we speak. Um, thinking also around when I'm asking for feedback, how am I asking for that feedback? So am I going, hey, Ali, can you can you give me some feedback on yesterday's presentation, for example? It's quite broad um, and lots of people can have that almost inclination to go, it was great, and then start thinking about actually what their feedback might have been. So if you're thinking about, well, actually, I want to increase my awareness around how that presentation actually went, perhaps rephrasing that question to what one thing could I have done differently? So narrowing it down to one specific area. Um, And 360 feedback that's anonymized. I think if you've got high levels of psychological safety, then you don't need to necessarily anonymize feedback. If it's not there or you're making an assumption that it's there, anonymizing that feedback can actually be a really helpful way to, to elicit 
um, some of that feedback that isn't otherwise that readily available. If there are things that you've done um, to to those of you in the room, if you've done things to kind of build a psychologically safe environment at work, we'd love to hear tactics and strategies you've used. So do please share your experiences and stories in the chat. Uh, It'll be great to kind of learn from them. Um, What are the kind of, I guess, emotional triggers to, to look for Ali in terms of knowing, okay, this awareness gap is having a detrimental effect on, on the people I work with. What are the things to look out for? So I guess it's twofold here. There's um, reflecting on your own emotional responses to things. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that any of us here kind of have outbursts of anger or anything in, in a room. But when you kind of have that eye roll moment or you have to pick up the phone and you kind of have that anticipation building is recognizing those feelings because they are normal. If you have them, it's a a good sign. It shows that you're a a normal human being. But then kind of taking that pause and that breath to think about if I'm aware of how I'm feeling and I'm kind of taking that little piece of self-reflection to kind of really, I guess, feel that in the moment, is then I'm making an active choice to regulate my behavior. Um, So there's one thing about recognizing those emotional feelings. I think On the flip side is thinking about what am I observing from the people that are in the room with me or on the call? Um, If I make a particular statement and you kind of get radio silence or the nogging dogs that you kind of see on Zoom, (laughs) is that telling you something? Um, It it may be that it's not, but also quite often these are are telltale signs. Um, Thinking about... uh, if I am hosting a team meeting and half the team we're dialing in on Zoom don't have their cameras on, um, am I asking the right questions or am I making assumptions about why people have their cameras on or not? And when I make those assumptions, am I therefore then going to make a statement, perhaps tongue in cheek? You know what's going on? Are people not done their their hair, which is often the reason I don't want to have my camera on? Um, but actually, then thinking about how that's likely to land. Um, So there's everyday scenarios that kind of crop up, but it's recognizing your your own emotional feelings and then choosing to regulate your behavior um, and then just kind of observing what you're what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're not hearing also is quite telling. A a consistent theme now seems to be kind of self-awareness. right? And and what you just said there, I can definitely connect to that. I, I think for in the early days of leading a team, I think I used to find myself under a lot of the stress and pressure, you, you kind of respond to things very quickly. And sometimes when you're responding that quickly, you've not had the chance to kind of form it in a way that is delivered in a way where it can get the right response from people. So it, sometimes it might um, might hurt their feelings. And it took a while to have the self-awareness to realise before you respond, take a moment to just pause. Like it's always, it might come as a reflex to go, you're saying this and your mind is acting fast and you want to really respond back. But just taking that moment to digest it before you say the thing you're going to say really helped, um, you know, deliver that message in a way that was far more uh, appropriate. But that took self-awareness. And I often think self-awareness is such an underrated skill. Um, How can you go about developing self-awareness? And it's tough, right, because most of it is reliant on observations of other people and those people choosing to share those observations with us. Um, So I already kind of alluded to 360 feedback is a really helpful tool. Um, I personally, I favour that. And perhaps it's more because I'm a coach, but I prefer that than I do kind of ad hocly asking people for feedback. And the reason that I think that is because most of the time we lean on the people we think are going to validate the feelings or the thoughts that we have. And it can be quite brave to seek out thoughts from people that we perhaps don't have the same strong relationships with. And are they likely to give slightly more objective feedback? Um, So 360 feedback is definitely great. Um, Some advice that was given to me by a manager earlier on in my career was around meditation. Um, It doesn't solve the problem of self-awareness, but I think that ability to be mindful and have that mindfulness is a good practice in being able to kind of hold that silent space in your head. 
Um, because it can feel uncomfortable and it can feel quite unproductive when your to-do list is growing every time you've pinged off an email. Um, and yet here I am encouraging you to take some time to think and do nothing. Um, yeah. But it's that silent space. And um, I, quite, I think there's a, a role here for managers in developing their coaching skills and their listening skills um, and being able to ask the right questions to their team members to give them that safe thinking space. Um, and for me, it's all about how do I create those thinking spaces throughout the days um, and who can I lean on that can help um, kind of create those for me. And in just on the 360 feedback, how often would you recommend you run that 360 feedback? Ali? Is there like an optimal every quarter, once a month? How often is good? Um, the, there's not really a black and white answer for that. I guess it depends on the team, the, the organisation and the culture. Um, I think in reality, if you're asking for that on a weekly basis, people are going to feel a bit frustrated for you, uh, yeah. t- towards you. Um Perhaps monthly is a is a good place to start. I think, again, depending on the the size of the business and the size of the three hundred and sixty feedback. Um, obviously, if you're looking at doing something um, systematically, then perhaps linking that in with your quarterly or, or um, half yearly reviews is a really good place to start. Um, but then also just thinking about can I lean on um, whatever technology that we have? Is there a, um, a HRIS that we use that enables me to request 360 feedback? Yeah. And thinking about are there pivotal moments, i.e., I, you know, I use the example of that presentation, um, or perhaps if you facilitated a team meeting or um or anything else that you're thinking, actually, I'd really like some feedback, is using that as an ad hoc moment to go out and request it um, and that might be as simple as potentially not entirely 360 but thinking about team yeah and um, you mentioned kind of developing coaching skills and and often one of the challenges you have in hyper growth companies um, is you get a lot of first-time managers and how do you go about I guess the challenge there is they're the first-time manager, and often even the people in the business haven't really been managers for that long uh, to have developed those skills themselves. So how do you go about helping first-time managers build critical skills like coaching? So there, there are lots of options. Obviously, you can look at developing some kind of program, whether that's partnering um, with kind of talent that you've got internally or with your people team, thinking about other consultancies that we can partner with that can help develop these skills as like a program. Um, I think if you're uh, perhaps time poor, money poor for word of a better expression you haven't got the the funds to invest in it in a whole leadership program is thinking about developing listening skills i hand on heart as a coach it is the one tool within coaching that is likely to have the biggest impact um we tend to listen to respond we hear the pieces that we like and then we respond to it um, and that's what like everyday listening. But I, if you can move your listening to what I would call kind of level two, where you're doing your active listening um, or even further where you're kind of intuitively listening. So you're listening or you're looking for body language, you're able to gauge the energy that is going to change the conversations that you have tenfold. Um, and then you can start asking more curious questions. So um, that's a great place to start if you're thinking, how do I develop my coaching skills um, or general leadership slash management skills is by starting with, with listening and then building on that with things like feedback and having a great career conversation or performance conversations. Um, but for me, yeah, all starts with listening. And, and I, you've worked with many high performance organizations. Are there common things you see across these businesses that they're all their managers do this certain something that you think we could all learn from that is a great question um I don't think on generally speaking we are again I'm leaning back on listening but I don't think that we're great listeners I think lots of us like to think we are good listeners um, and we might delve into episodes of active listening I think I don't see global or level three listening really across the board. I also think that this awareness piece is a gap. And however, 
it, I'm thinking about some of the different clients that I, I've worked with. If I think about kind of hyper growth companies, um, typically kind of demographically speaking, a younger um, in terms of kind of employee population than perhaps some kind of enterprise or corporate clients that I've worked with. And this self-awareness gap looks quite different between them. Typically, um, and it'd be interesting for everybody that's online for their observations here, um, but people working in hyper growth tend to be more open to asking for feedback. And there's that kind of fail fast mentality. Um, and I think also, and I include myself in, in, in this category, um, earlier on in our careers, again, generally speaking, um, so we have the appetite to ask for feedback. Um, thinking about kind of that enterprise size client, you then have people that are perhaps at the other end of their career, and I'm stereotyping somewhat here, experts in what they do. They've been doing something for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but the flip side of that is they've been working with the same people, the same industry, they're kind of tunnel visioned. They don't necessarily have that breadth of, of knowledge or experience. So they, they look quite different. Um, I guess the challenges that they face are also quite different, right? Um, in terms of access to, to budgets, time, thinking about how fast paced um, kind of hyper growth organizations are working at. You mentioned kind of level three listening, level two listening, Ali. I, I mean, I'm not aware of the different levels of listening. I don't know if everyone else in, in the room is. Would it be useful to, to just hear maybe just a summary of what those different levels are? Yeah, sure. So level one um, is your everyday listening. So uh, having a, a general conversation like we are now, I, I'm listening to the words that you're saying so that I can respond to them. Um, right. This happens if you're down the pub with your mates, you're going for a walk and you kind of we interject with our stories and our personal experiences. Um, we spend most of our time here. Um, you've then got kind of that level two listening, which is active listening. Um, and this is what where we are actually listening to hear what's being said. We're listening to understand rather than to respond. Um, and when we're doing that, we're kind of leaning in with that empathy piece. Um, and we're really trying to see something from their perspective. So we're hearing what's going on. The jump then becomes from this active listening to this, what we call level three or in coaching is like global listening. I would refer to it as intuitive listening. Um, and it's here that you're able to notice the energy between you and the person you're having the conversation with. Much easier um, to do when you're physically together in, in a room. Um, but then thinking about what does that mean if you're having conversations like, like we are. So, for example, if I'm looking up, typically like this or this is my thinking face, is picking up on things like that. Um, being able to pick up on body language. So is somebody leaning into the camera? Are they kind of pushing themselves away? If you can see hands and legs, which is kind of hard when you're over screen, um, thinking about what's that telling me? Um, and, and really thinking about the words that somebody is, is using. Are they telling me what they want me to hear? Or are they actually telling me kind of what it is that's going on? So um, everyday listening, we're listening to respond. Active listening, we are listening to understand. And then that level three listening is really kind of leaning in and being intuitive with what we're, we're seeing, we're observing, we're hearing. Thanks for explaining that, Ali. That was super helpful. No one more question. One more question from me before I open it up to, to the Q&A. So keep your questions coming in the chat and I will come to you to ask your question. Um, what role can L&D play here, Annie, in terms of closing that awareness gap? What can L&D do? Um, I think the biggest thing that we can do as a, as a function is to ironically raise the awareness of, of the awareness gap, but kind of act as a spokesperson or encourager or facilitator of this as a conversation at a senior level. It's not tangible. And I think we're, as L&D, we're always challenged to what's the return on investment of this particular intervention. Um, and this, it's hard to quantify because it's very personal. Um, but what can we do? So one, I think we can encourage people to talk about it more. Um, the more we can get senior leaders to 
talk about their own experiences of their own awareness gaps and where they've fallen foul to it and what they've learned, I think is going to have a ripple effect on the business. Um, when we are delivering interventions, it can be really um, easy for us to kind of implement a particular program. We ask for some feedback on it. And I think then longer term, when we're looking at behavioral changes, we tend to be slightly weaker at measuring some of that. Um, but how often do we actually interject and build in time for that self-reflection? So whether that's us as perhaps the, the deliverer of a programme facilitating conversations and thinking time, whether that's we building into programmes conversations that have to happen between the individual and their manager to facilitate some of that reflection on how they've implemented what they've learnt. Um, it would also be great, and I don't know if this exists, if it does, great, if not, somebody should build it, um, but something that you could link into either Slack or more importantly, I guess, your, your email calendar. I do this manually, um, but where it just builds in perhaps 10 minutes buffer where it's just you attended this or you had this meeting, you flagged it as important, you need to self-reflect before you go into your next meeting. Um, I know that Outlook and, and Teams have an ability to not allow you totally back to back, um, but actually creating a space where that is my thinking space would be really, really helpful. So, again, I don't know if, if that exists as a piece of technology, but um, it definitely should. Um, first question, I'm going to come to Isabella. But before I do, Ali, just on that self-awareness is one of those tricky ones where everyone thinks they're self-aware. Um, right, like a everyone thinks they're self aware, so it becomes difficult to realize you have that awareness gap in, in the first place. So, how do you tackle that? Do you just start from a place where you go, just accept everyone has an awareness gap problem, and uh, you just got to accept it as a starting point? Is, is that the best way to do it? I think it can be super helpful to accept that there isn't a finish line to this, so. Right. I think probably 85 90 percent of us would consider ourselves self-aware I, I would probably estimate about 10 percent of us are actually really self-aware um so accepting that we are probably within that minor uh, the majority of the 85 to 90 percent but um you know it's there isn't necessarily a test to say I'm 56 percent self-aware but accepting that there's work to do I think is it is a great place to start um and perhaps then just being brave and, and asking for some specific feedback at a 360 level um, might help gauge how self-aware you actually are. Um, all right. Isabella, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Hi there. Hi, Ali. I'm Bella. Hi, yeah. Um, my question for you is how do you deal with challenging situations where the person you know, doesn't have great self-awareness and if they're not open to change. Okay, so twofold there, that they're not open to change is the hardest piece of the puzzle to, to tackle. Um, if somebody isn't self-aware, then I, I guess it's it, us accepting that that's where they are right now and then thinking about, well, what are some of the things that I can do to encourage that? Um, I think asking those really curious questions. So, for example, um, Ali, how do you think that went? Um, how do you think that landed? Um, okay, that's great that you think that it landed particularly well. Thinking about who else was in the room, how else could that have been received? So we're almost acting as that facilitator again of that thinking space to ask them lots of curious and kind of challenging questions that just help them see things from a slightly different perspective. So if they can't see it themselves, we are asking them questions to help them think about those different responses. Um, in terms of kind of that not willingness, willing to change, that's a bigger beast because you're working with somebody that has got ingrained beliefs that are valid for them, but that might not fit the situation or, or the organisation if you're thinking about this culturally. Um, so in terms of how I would actually go ahead and tackle that one, I think, again, listening, why do they feel the way they do? Because their feelings are 
totally valid, even if they are not the feelings that we want them to be feeling, um, and asking them to be part of the journey. So if there's a particular thing that you're trying to influence them on, um, starting when we're thinking about communicating with why and not why we think something's important, but why they think something's important so that we're speaking their language and um, getting them on the bus who has a better expression. Are there are opportunities for them to contribute um, asking for them if they've got perhaps a critical eye um, and by critical eye, I mean, actually aren't particularly happy with the thing that you're trying to influence them on, getting them to voice their opinion, getting them to back that up with data um, and then asking those really curious questions. And I think that the biggest thing that I've learned to accept is you can't please 100 percent of people 100 percent of the time. Um, and these things take time, but in listening to them and encouraging them in the right direction, that should help you gauge a better understanding about has this person got valid reasons for feeling the way they do? The answer to that should be yes. Um, but do I feel that I can get them to where we need to be? Yes, great. If not, then perhaps that's a slightly different conversation. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that, Ali. I think for me, what has been useful as well is to accept if someone feels a particular way, then that feeling in itself is valid, right? So you might think you've delivered a message in a really clear way, but if the other person receiving it thinks it was unclear, it doesn't matter how confident I am I was clear in that message, it's valid that someone feels that way. And that gives you enough of a reason to explore, could you have done it better? And, and often I think, people will stop at the point where, well, I think I was clear. So that's where that matters. And that's, I guess, goes back to the lack of um, self-awareness and on just listening to, to what feedback you're getting from others. Um, Morton, I, I really like your point around kind of psychological safety. So if I can get you on camera to, to kind of um, share your experiences there and, and ask your question, that'd be great. Sure. Of course. Hi, guys. Um, I hope you can hear me. There's a little bit of uh, chatter in the background, but I hope it works out. Basically, um, I think a lot of uh, psychological experience, uh, sorry, psychological safety, like my experience tells me that in the workplace, it really starts at the top of the hierarchy and kind of creates a dribble down effect. So if there's a strategic disalignment or if we preach values around, say, communication transparency, but you don't necessarily see that when, for example, uh, someone is fired, uh, laid off, or, or if someone leaves, are we being true to the reason or what's happening in, in that context? Um, and I think I'm just wondering if we actually um, talk about things the right way, if we can see that there is this disalignment, what is it then we can actually do? Like, Sometimes you might have top leadership that goes in one direction, but you have actual good people, leaders, uh, lower down the hierarchy that actually wants to make an impact or, or, or make a difference. But what can they then maybe do to deal with that disalignment and still be sure that their team feels safe? That's a, yeah. a really great question. Um, a really great question. And I was um, facilitating a session on psychological safety. Um, I was going to say last Friday, but it was, it was the week before. Um, and the hardest thing to do when, it, when you're really trying to foster this is if the senior leaders aren't on board, because um, you're absolutely right. They have a ripple effect on the whole business. And if we say one thing in our policies or our behavior, or our actions, say something different, then actually the messages get diluted um, and the level of psychological safety goes down. Um, my first place to start would be with my team. That's where I can have the, the biggest impact. Um, I all quite often think about um, if I'm in a particular position where I think my level of control or influence is, is somewhat limited, is like, what can I, I'm doing a circle, my circle of control, <laughs> what can I focus on right now and have actual impact on? What is it that I can influence? And what is it that's out of my control? Um, and depending on um, kind of your level of influence, if the board level is out of your control, it's out of your control. Focus on the things you can have an impact on. Um, and, you know, perhaps asking yourself some self-reflective questions about long term, what does this mean for me in terms of working within a, a business that isn't aligned to, to my values? Um, I always think that can be a really positive conversation to have. Um, but start focusing your team, 
focus on who are the the people that actually um have like kind of my influences I suppose the people that I have a strong relationship with that I can influence that perhaps can do the influencing for me um and don't be afraid to to speak up and I think sharing some of those difficult messages but backing that up with data so it's not just anecdotal um yeah that would be my my advice there thanks Danny and thanks Morton for the question um Rachel if you'd like to ask your question yeah um I was just wondering if you had any advice for like new leaders so um like often you're in a position especially at small companies where you're like all on the same level and then as you grow you start to introduce hierarchies so then how do you start to do some of this stuff because there's like this balance of imposter syndrome where you're like oh like don't listen to me I don't know anything but at the same time it's like well there's a reason why you're at certain points and there's ways that you can support other people and you need to step into that I don't know yeah absolutely so the relationship probably feels slightly imbalanced you've gone from peer to to manager um if it feels uncomfortable for you it probably also feels uncomfortable for them too um and actually I think sometimes just laying your cards on the table and and being honest about some of these things can break down a lot of the barriers um but being clear about and you mentioned there Rachel about imposter syndrome you know if you're in that role you've been promoted to that role for a reason what are the strengths that I can bring to that this particular role what are the areas that actually I see as potential areas of development do I have any blind spots but um whilst it can feel really uncomfortable it also leaves you in a a really um kind of optimum position where you've got this group of people that were your peers and hopefully you had quite a strong relationship with these individuals is to ask them for the candid feedback like this is the first time that I'm managing um I feel really uncomfortable because we used to go to lunch together and now I have to have a conversation about your performance this doesn't feel normal um what advice do you have for me to help me be the best manager for you um and let them do the legwork and the hard work for you um when we make assumptions that awareness gap's going to increase so if we can limit the amount of assumptions that we're making by asking them how we can behave to get the best from them that will help us better align our intentions with the impact that we want to have and, and to add to that um Rachel I mean I've felt imposter syndrome so often and I still do and one of the things that have really kind of helped me is speaking to other managers and leaders and you realize how common uh, it is I, I would go as far as saying most leaders and managers I've met all uh, feel imposter syndrome at some point or, or another and what's also helped me in our uh, organization in the team is actually openly sharing that right is the expectation here is I'm not a manager or a leader because I have all of the answers there are some things I do well and there's some things I don't do well. And the reason I am where I am is because the things I do well matter and, and I'm open to learning the things I don't. And I think that, again, comes back to the self-awareness point of it's OK to be self-awareness, self-aware about your strengths and weaknesses and to candidly share that. Um, and I think that in itself, as a manager being open to share that, I think creates that psychological safety for someone else in the team who's also experiencing imposter syndrome and feels like they're not good at certain things to openly share that and it to be absolutely fine um so that's what i've i've found useful and hopefully that is helpful um thanks for the question rachel alfie would you like to ask your question hey everybody um so yeah my question was just around um some of the kind of feedback and listening skills Ali, that you mentioned beforehand do you reckon um from my uh, vision, often you see these kind of skills as being developed as part of a management training program or some sort of leadership skills development. Do you reckon that embedding those kind of skills into your general employee population would be kind of beneficial for organisations at all? Or do you reckon it's something that should more be filtered and refined further down the line at, um, at that employee life cycle? Yeah, great question. I think just generally in life, the better that we could listen. I think there's much more likely to have positive outcomes. Um, a, a key kind of example there, if I think not about work, but is when you're kind of letting off a bit of steam and perhaps you're ranting about a loved one or a friend or a situation, and then somebody offers you advice and you think, I didn't ask you for advice. I just wanted someone to listen. Um, and that's kind of the, the biggest example that I can think about in everyday life. So I think, yes, we quite often see it in leadership 
programs because it is such a fundamental um, tool that we need to be able, uh, competency that we need to be able to do as leaders. Um, and I guess what those workshops or programs do is give managers the space to practice that um, but with all of these things like a learning intervention is a learning intervention I'm sharing some knowledge I'm holding a space for you to be able to practice it the real kind of um, prize or the the benefits that you get from it are when you actually put it into practice kind of longer term outside of the scope of a of a program. So this is a skill that can be learned by everybody in everyday uh, kind of moments and interactions that we have with our teams. So um, I think if you perhaps thinking, how can I as an individual, how can my team developing this is kind of giving them a bit of a challenge to say the next time you have a conversation, I just want you to kind of hear what's going on and I want you to listen to understand um, and recognise when you hold that space, it will feel probably quite uncomfortable. That's a good sign. Um, And get them to count to five. And I quite often, I still use like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, um, so that you actually get the full five seconds. Um, Hold it for that space of time and then interject. Um, so I've kind of rambled on a bit there, but yes, we see it in leadership programs, but it's a skill that everyone will benefit from. Thanks, Alfie, for the question. We've got time for a couple more questions, so do post them in the chat. Um, Julie, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Abby. First of all, thank you for um, all the advice you've given so far. Uh, just a quick one around objective feedback. You mentioned something about a shit sandwich and avoiding giving mixed signals. So do you have like a, a standard, there, oh, there's no standard, I think, but what would be the best structure to give feedback to your peers, whether you're a manager or a peer-to-peer, that would be more objective than subjective? So what would be a good structure? So not like a shit sandwich where you get a mixed signal. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that don't know a shit sandwich, you're giving a positive piece of feedback followed by a negative piece, followed by a positive piece. Um, Don't use it. Sometimes I see this in management programs. Please don't ever use it. Um, Flip side of that, what uh, frameworks could I use? COIN works really, really well. Um, So COIN standing either for care or for context. I think if you can go into a, a feedback conversation with the right intentions it's a good place to start so why am I giving this piece of feedback what am I hoping to achieve from it how might this land based on the individual that I'm giving feedback to Um, but then what's the situation what's the context have I asked for permission and then thinking about the observation so what is it that I have actually observed or heard or seen Um, so for example um, in yesterday's meeting um, you overspoke Ali. So I'm being clear about the context, I'm being clear about what I've observed. Then I'm talking about the impact that that's had. So I'm letting them know actually that behavior, what impact did that have? And then following that up with next steps. So the best way to follow up with next steps is to ask a coaching question. How else could you have approached this? What could you have done differently? Or if this is a positive thing, Um, you know, from your perspective, what worked really well. So I'm getting them to do the thinking. If I need to be a bit more directive, then it's, you know, perhaps I might prescribe what those next steps look like. So next time, please, could you be the last to speak, for example? Um, But it's uh, context slash care. I think care is a really important piece in there. What you've observed, the impact that that's had, and then the next steps. Um, that can be a really helpful framework if you're like writing out like a script and I'm not recommending that you go in and and read the script but that you enter that conversation feeling kind of confident and prepared Um, and actually what you'll then find is over time you'll probably just dip in and out so you might just talk about the impact um, if they've uh, described some of the other areas Um, they might do the impact piece for you Um, again that listening piece and holding that space I think most of the time if something hasn't gone to plan we kind of know we kind of have a feeling that something didn't quite go as we expected so if we can ask some of those curious questions and let them do the thinking they might also do the hard work for us which means we don't have to give the piece of feedback we probably don't want to give um, but not being afraid to give it if we need to. 
I love that, Ali. Thank you for sharing that framework. And Julie, thanks for the question. Um, Morton, do you want to ask another question? Over to you. Yes, I I more or less forgot that I actually asked the question for and not just had a reflection, a reflection. But in past experience and from a lot of network within startups and scale-ups and partly hyper-growth companies as well, I've seen that there seems to be a somewhat tendency towards favoring performance or hard skills in the beginning when you look at your your mass of people and then start to promote people to team leads. And these people don't necessarily have innate people skills or the empathetic leadership skills that could be valuable when you actually start to grow a team and, and grow the business. Are there ways to help these new kind of hard skilled leaders um, to grow and actually grow into the role and, and their people skills, or would you eventually maybe have to part ways with them if they don't align enough with values and and, and these soft skills? Yeah, that is is such a, a common common theme, and it, and it's understandable, right? Someone's great at what they do, and then you're you're growing, so they get promoted. Um, two totally different skill sets. Um, it really frustrates me that we call them soft skills because they're the really bloody hard skills. Um, they're really hard to, to get right. Um, I think longer term, when we're looking at organizations that have the highest performing teams, it's the ones that have high levels of psychological safety. It's the ones that have a clear sense of direction. It's the teams where individuals feel they've got purpose and meaning. It's all built around these soft skills. So longer term is, is somebody that's technical that doesn't possess those skills likely to be successful in growing and nurturing a high performing team. Possibly not. But that's not to say that somebody can't develop those because they are skills, just as somebody might have learned to um, to code, for example, or they've trained to become an accountant. We learn these soft skills um, and we learn the art of listening and we learn to give feedback using frameworks. So um, for me, it's about looking at somebody's potential. And I think one of the beautiful things with thinking about this awareness gap, if you're I'm going to use an example of swimming here. I used to used to swim. Um, I'd have a coach and my coach would be saying, you know, Ali, what we're going to do is we're going to get you to swim 100 metres backstroke in one minute and 10. I'd be thinking, really? I don't think I can do that. And then I achieved that. And all of a sudden there's this potential that actually I could be doing this in a minute and five or a minute and two. And I can go from swimming at county level to swimming at national levels. Um, and actually I think there's a, because of this awareness gap, when people are able to start closing it, but it also helps them recognize their potential. So um, what can I do to encourage that individual that's new to being a manager, to give them the the space to try these things, to fail, to recognize that it's not going to go perfect first time, they're going to give someone feedback and it's going to land terribly. Um, We can learn from that. And I think the thing, if you're seeing that progress over time and that develops, great. If you're down the line and the person isn't demonstrating the the right skills that you need for leading a team, that's a different conversation. Um, And that's a really positive, again, conversation to have. We quite often think these are negative or difficult conversations. And I'm not shying away from the fact that they won't be difficult, but if the outcome is that that person ends up in a role that they are happier and perform better in, um, and the team has somebody that's leading them that has the right skill set, then for me, long term, that's a win win. Um, so yeah, work work with them. It's a skill that we develop. And, and just to add to that, I often find with first time managers, it's that the initial struggle is with a mindset shift where they need to move from being an individual contributor, where they are solely focused on their output and the, and the outcomes they're driving in the business to really understanding deeply that it's no longer about their output. Their output is their team's output. And so how do you coach, give feedback, create the psychological safety to drive the team's output? And often that's where the struggle is because they're thinking about it really from what's stopping me from delivering my output, but rather than understanding it's no longer about that. I think a great 
fantastic book I'd recommend to, to kind of first time manage or any managers is called High Output Management by Andy Grove, um, where you know he talks about things you can leverage to increase your team's output. And one of those is learning, um, because learning is a high leverage activity that changes behavior over a longer period of time and can scale. Um, so great book, I recommend. We're almost out of time, but I've got one more question for you, Annie, before we wrap up. Uh, what's the one thing we can all do this week um, to become more self-aware? One thing. Um, ask yourself the question, how else might this land? So if you're going in to deliver a particular piece of feedback, how else might this land? If you're going into a meeting, how else could I facilitate this? Um, just widen your um, your kind of reflection to more than just the assumptive output that you're hoping to achieve. Ali, thank you very much for coming on the show. You've been absolutely incredible. I've learned a ton. Hopefully everyone else in the virtual room has too. Uh, the next l and Disrupt is the State of l and 2022. Uh, we'll be joined by Lavinia Merdintu and Ross Stevensons on the 2nd of March. So do find the link on our social channels and we'll also share it on our follow-up uh, email. Thank you very much for joining and look forward to seeing you in the next installment of l and Disrupt Live. Thank you. Have a great week.